خلاص نبدو على بركة الله يعني محاضرة اليوم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته معكم منصور خضر Welcome everyone to our heart failure lecture series Our presenter today is well known to everyone Dr. Muhammad Lahrari Consultant cardiologist with a special interest in heart failure It's share of heart failure group at the Emirates Cardiac Society um, at Tawam Hospital, United Arab Emirates. He will be presenting the challenges in the diagnosis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We have on the expert panel, Dr. Ilham Al Gaddafi, Assistant Professor, Consultant Cardiologist, and Head of Valvular Heart Disease Clinic at Tripoli University uh, Hospital. We also have Dr. Salah Al Badri, Consultant Cardiologist and Advanced Heart uh, Failure Specialist from Hamad Medical uh, Corporation, uh, Qatar. So without any further ado, uh, Dr. Muhammad, the stage is yours. Okay, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Really, well, it's, it's an honor and pleasure to be, to be with you and uh, to contribute to the, this uh, interesting series. And this is a, really a, a follow-on from uh, Dr. Salah al-Badri, really great talk, which I, I missed, but I really I watched it later on. So he, he's in which he covered really FF in from all aspects, including the diagnosis. But I, so my lecture is just to expand on the diagnosis a little bit, and I just show uh, you know how difficult uh, it is, and 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 really try to raise awareness of this problem from the diagnosis point of view. And it is something I think a lot of us miss misses or, or contribute to other other, other problem. Um, and I don't think even at the end of this talk that will be a clear answer, but just uh, at least for people to know that even if the picture in front of them, it does not really fit that what they think it should. It does not necessarily that the diagnosis is not there, if you see what I mean. So um, uh, anyway. I've got nothing to disclose. I just remind people about the uh, you know the new diagnosis of heart failure, which is really symptoms or signs of heart failure with underlying structure or function of the mitral of the heart, plus either raised natural hypoxia or objective evidence of a pulmonary system congestion. You know the classification now of the uh, HFRF, HFPF, uh, HFMRF, and the new one which is the improved ejection fraction. So this is all being covered before. Again, just to remind you that you know have have beef uh, as proportion to the heart failure, especially during admission, uh, uh, people admitted to the hospital is actually going higher and higher, and now reaching you know fifty percent, while the have refer to only thirty five percent. So the, the uh, well, more and more patients, uh, the, the prevalence of heart failure is, is going up, but the proportion of have beef to have refer actually is, is 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 reversing or or, or going up for the have beef. And then, then again, I get that's mainly because of more awareness of the problem and the diagnosis and, and the availability of treatment. And this slightly contrary to probably what Dr. Hlam just uh, mentioned to me uh, a week or so ago that she's trying to do some collecting some data on Libya and what her preliminary finding that actually, in particularly in women, only 10% of heart failure are actually have death, where it should be, you know, more in, his, uh, in women. So we're not really diagnose uh, problems as we should do. And HFPF is not a, a benign condition. Mortality is, is equal to HFPF. That's what we need to remind ourselves and remind our patient. This is really a serious condition. So heart contracting well, it's not necessarily mean that you, you're going to do well. And why we are interested in this now, because we now we do have, you know, a, a available effective therapy. Um, yes, it is, it is, uh, uh, it is a disease of comorbidities, you know, and you know you have to treat. We have to look at these and treat them. But there's also effective specific therapy for this problem. It does it does really change and improve outcome, especially with the SGLT inhibitor, with the Emperor Reserve, and also the deliver with the DABA now more recently. And meta analysis show that the, these treatments are really does uh, you know uh, uh, affect the outcome you know, hospitalization and combination of hospitalization and death. And uh, do not underst underestimate the, uh, the importance of reduction of hospitalization, because uh, really uh, hospitalization is a marker of worsening heart failure. It's a marker of poor prognosis. So if you try you start getting admitted and readmitted and admitted, the, the, the course is downhill and the end is death. 
And uh, the guidelines now tell us now where, uh, that we, we have, in addition to the RSP is very important, a CO2 inhibitor class 2A actually should be in our class one after the delivered trial. And, and the other therapy, yes, the evidence is not as strong, but they are, they, they are, they are in the guidelines and you uh, uh, should consider them or may consider them. I personally use them. So uh, heart failure, uh, HFPF, can be you know, relatively easy to diagnose if the patient admitted with overblown you know, picture of congestion, X-ray, classic symptoms, uh, you have a good science, abnormality, abnormal X-ray. But on the other hand, if somebody come to you with just you know, vague symptoms of exercise, intolerance, and breathlessness, but when you examine them, you don't find anything. You, even you do an ECG, it could be entirely normal. The X-ray could be entirely normal. You do labs normal. Even you do, if you do it in tear, it can be normal. Um, you, you do an echo, you, you get this report that's your, your bit of LVH, slightly dilated LA, you know, a bit of TR, septal E prime 5, E to E prime ratio is 12. So, okay, you look at the coronaries, you find no evidence, no evidence for underlying airway disease. Could this patient still have HFPF? Uh, we'll find out. Diagnosed heart failure, uh, HFPF has been a, a really uh, uh, been difficult and serious with uh, uncertainties. And this has been for the last maybe decade or so. And, you know, the expert people in heart failure, when they met in 2015, they said, oh, there's many uncertainties around the diagnosis and treatment of HFPF. And there is no single, and I think still the case, non-invasive diagnostic test for HFPF. There isn't a test you do, this is HFPF, single one. And, and the absence of diagnostic clinical criteria is, is actually uh, it's a major barrier to progress. That was statement then. Not only that, even the last you know, decade or so, the old guidelines, and also if you look at a trial that looked into HFPF, they've actually used you know, various criteria, even various echo criteria to diagnose HFPF in their trials or even in the old guidelines. And even different cutoff figures uh, to uh, include people uh, into the trials or to diagnose HFPF. Um, so there wasn't really consensus or agreement on the criteria to diagnose HFPF. I mean, this reminds us with the story of the four blind uh, men and the elephant. So everyone sees it differently. The nephrologist will say it's the heart, the pulmonologist will say it's the kidneys, the cardiologist will say it's the, it's the, it's the lungs, et cetera, et cetera. So the presentation, I said, it could be either the one that acute admissions, maybe diagnosis is easier, or the ex impaired excise intolerance that you see in the clinic or in the office where the diagnosis could be more complex. So the guidelines tell us that the diagnosis has to be, and still is, primarily based on a good, having good history, a good, good examination. But for between HIF and BIF, really, the, 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 the symptom and signs are non-specific and there are a lot of similarities. And when, when we were looked at you know, various registries and respective data for HIF BIF patient involving hundreds of thousands of patients, um, and the, the, what the, the finding that first that this patient with HIF BIF uh, have more likely to have associated uh, comorbidities, the hypertension, the diabetes, the kidney disease, the, um, uh, um, the asthma, the so, so on and so forth, more than HFREF, although HFREF also associates with comorbidities. And what they find that there is, you know, generally HFREF tends to be older than HFREF. It tends to be more common in women. Hypertension tends to, to be, seem to be more common in HFREF. Coronary artery, on the other hand, is more common in HFREF. AF is more common in HFREF, HFBF, sorry, uh, diabetes and obesity associated more with HFBF. But is that more likely, more and more, but nothing so specific or diagnostic. So I'm going to talk about each item to help us in the diagnosis and what the challenges associated with it. So from the clinical perspective, really, you, we see a lot of, you know, old women with a bit of edema, a bit breathless, but they don't necessarily, this due to heart failure. And HFPF is known to be heterogeneous disorder, and the symptoms can be due to underlying associated conditions like anemia, CKD, obesity, chronic disease, etc. Examination can be difficult. Edema is not specific. GVB may not be able to be visible in those, particularly in those very obese people. What about tests? What about this natural arteric peptide, the gold standard test to help to support diagnosis of heart failure, which is really well established? 
Again, if it is raised, it does support your heart failure. And if it is very high, it's also a prognostic marker. And there are cutoff figures. So if the, in acute setting, if, it, if the, we use a lot of interval meal less than 300, heart failure is unlikely. And if it is uh, uh, more than 400, although it's age dependent, uh, this heart failure is, is more likely. Uh, but you get this gray zone in the middle where, where you don't know. Not only that, sorry, and in the in the in the in the outpatient or or or, or uh, non-acute setting, we use much lower cutoff figures to support the diagnosis or be against the diagnosis of heart failure. Uh, however, the problem with the nitrogen but in HFPF, a normal value, even a normal value, does not exclude uh, HFPF. And one of the uh, so try explanation for this that uh, the release of natural peptides is really comes because of stretching of the, of the, of the ventricle, which it doesn't have that much in HFPF because of this left ventricular stiffness. Um, um, and, and it's been shown that up to 20% of invasively confirmed HFPF to have a normal natural peptide. So one in five of HFPF patients have a normal, normal natural peptide. So normal natural peptide does not exclude HFPF. And obesity, which is a, a common and healthcare patient for various reasons not well un understood, is associated with lower natriuretic peptide. Atrial fibrillation, on the other hand, itself causes a raise of natriuretic peptide, not necessarily uh, because of heart failure. And we, you know the list of uh, causes of raised natriuretic peptide both cardiac and non-cardiac, and they are not heart failure as listed here that I won't go through. So there are a lot of causes of raised natural but does not necessarily mean heart failure always. You have to exclude other thing, other cause. So what do we need to diagnose HFPF? You need to have symptoms or signs of heart failure. You need to have an echo or other modality that show ejection fracture equal to more than 50%. And you need to exclude what they call secondary HFPF, which is yeah, the, your underlying valvular heart disease, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy, pericardial disease, etc. And then you need to have this is important. You need evidence of elevated filling pressure. And the more of this you can get, the more likely that you have a diagnosis with an atrial peptide or resting echocardiograph markers, which will go through the E prime, the E to E prime, lift atrial enlargement, lift ventricular mass, from hypertension, TLS. Failing that, you may need to resort to stress, either stress echo or invasive hemodynamics. We'll go through. So what are the echo diastolic uh, uh, parameter that we look for and use? First, you need to just remember that diastolic dysfunction by echo, it does not equal or mutually exclusive with HFPF. A lot of, you can see a lot of patients with diastolic dysfunction and echo that they don't have heart failure. And the distal function indicate how failure only in the presence of symptoms or signs. So in the echocardiography, we're looking for evidence of what we call impaired filling or high filling pressures. The first thing we do, we look for, we do is the mitral inflow bus doubler. And we look at the E wave, and, uh, which is the passive filling of the uh, ventricle from the atrium, and the A, -A, -A wave, which is the atrial contraction. And we just have to do it. Probably, probably, probably. Uh, so the, we have to, the sample volume has to be at the level of mitral path leaflet tips, not at the annulus. Um, and we have to remember that it's a uh, volume de dependent. And we have to know the limitation of the use of mitral inflow measurement. The diffusion will occur with tachycardia, pacing, bundle branch block. And also you cannot use it in patient with atrial fibrillation, it's a flutter. And that's the volume and also age dependent. So they are the, the older you are, you bigger your E wave. The, the other, probably more relevant and important uh, parameter we, we study in echocardiography is the tissue doubler uh, imaging and tissue doubler velocity. And the, 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 the idea that in, 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 in HFPF, you have abnormality in the longitudinal function, the heart does not relax in. Uh, in the it does not elongate. So it does not elongate. So if you are uh, measuring the velocity of the tissue from the apex, or you probe the, from probe the apex, and your sample value should be at the, exactly at the mitral valve annulus either side, the septal and the mitral, 
septal and the lateral. And if you have impairment, if only elongation, so elongation will give you a negative wave, so a negative E prime. So if it's normal, you have a, a big uh, velocity, big, big, uh, big negative wave, which is the E prime. So if you have a normal, if you have a, a restricted elongation, restricting uh, relaxation of uh, abnormality in the diastolic function, then that E prime will be small. Um, uh, but you have to remember that, that again, this is this is angle dependence. If you do it with a you know uh, awkward angle that's not parallel uh, to the uh, to the v, to the movement of your matter of annulus, you will get a wrong reading. And if you measure from the body of the ventricle of the atrium, obviously you get a false reading. So it has to be exactly at the matter of annulus either side. Uh, but. And, and if you really get it, and you've got a huge big E way, E prime, then you probably have a, a normal diastolic function. And if you have an E to A ratio, eight, which means that the E prime is big, so the ratio is, is low, then also it's just with normal filling. However, if you have a, a small E septal E prime of less than seven and lesser less than 10, so the lateral always moves more because it's free. Uh, so, but, the, but if it is less than 10 centimeters per second lateral or less than seven septal, then that's a mark of the storage function. And if the ratio is more than nine, that has a sensitivity of 78%, specificity of 59%. And if it's more, more than 14, that correlates with really a high pulmonary wedge depression. And so the higher the ratio, the E to A, 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 to A prime ratio, uh, the, the, high, the higher the correlation with the pulmonary wage pressure. And they use a cutoff of 15 as, uh, as an important uh, marker. But it has its limitations. So if you have a heavy calcified mitral valve, if you have a prosthetic valve, if you have a, you know, somebody has infarction, there is a region of emotional medicine which affects the movement, then you cannot use it. Uh, lip and the branch block, pacemaker, atrial fibrillation, et cetera. So the other, the other parameter we, we study or we look into to look for evidence of raised uh, high filling pressure is, this, is, the, is the volume of the left atrium. And not the size diameter. It's not like four or five centimeter by um, two dimension. It has to be uh, done by Simpson method. It has to be indexed uh, to the, to the, uh, 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 to the uh, uh, body uh, weight and size. It has to be indexed. So and any volume index more than 34 ml per meter square, that's consistent with the asteroid function. It's a marker of high filling pressure. The problem obviously, obviously and that's a graph showing that. The problem you have to exclude other cause of uh, uh, dilated left atrium, you know, shunts, mitovascular heart disease, atrial fibrillation, et cetera. The other parameter we, we, we study, we look into to look for uh, evidence of high filling pressure, is the elevated pulmonary artery systolic pressure. And if you have a TR more than 2.8 meters per, per second, or pressure of more than 35 millimeter mercury, that has a, a slightly lower sensitivity, but high specificity of uh, uh, diastolic dysfunction. Uh, and the, the, the thinking that if you have a high pulmonary pressure, you will have a, a leftward shift of the, vent of the septum and bearing the, le the, the left ventricular filling. Uh, again, the problem, the challenge, that you need to exclude underlying airway disease. Somebody has COBD, they will have rate pulmonary pressure. It does not necessarily indicate uh, left ventricular uh, HFF. Now, the other parameter we look at uh, to support evidence of diastolic function is the thickness of the ventricle, the, left, the high left ventricular uh, mass. Uh, and we will try not to measure just the thickness of the, of the, of the ventricle, but measure the mass itself. And uh, if you get a left ventricular mass index of more than 95 in women, uh, or more than 15 uh, gram per meter square in men, uh, especially with a relative force thickness more than 0.4, which we'll mention in a minute, these are really quite good criteria um, to support your diagnosis of HFPF. And I said, we should do not use the wall thickness, the wall thickness, but should the left ventricular mass in, in, in motor machine uh, you can get this even from the uh, M mode. Now, the relative wall thickness is basically, it is two times the posterior wall thickness divided by left ventricular diastolic diameter. And this has been associated 
uh, if it is more than 0.42, it's treated with pathological or significant lymphatic hypertrophy. There are just a few uh, names that I'm just going to mention just to remind people. So the classical concentric left ventricular hypertrophy that we see is that the wall is thickened, but also the mass is high. Um, but in concentric remodeling, somebody will have a small ventricle, but they have a quite thick uh, wall, and they, so the, the relative wall thickness will be high, but the mass itself may not be that high. While in eccentric hypertrophy, like AR, whatever, dilated ventricle, so the mass will be high, but the wall itself uh, may not be that thick. Uh, but the criteria for supported diagnosis of HFPF is having a high mass, preferably also with a high relative wall thickness. Uh, another sort of minor criteria that we use to help us to diagnose HFF is GLS or global limiting strain. For those who are not familiar with it, basically it's a measurement of the deformation of the change in length of the muscle resulting from force. And basically, when your heart contracts, that's the negative, give you negative value. So the higher the negative value means the heart is working better. Um, uh, if it is positive, that the heart is working not as good. So it's nice to see a red. Uh, uh, figures with minus 20 or or, or, or less. Um, uh, any figures less than 16 is associated with HFPF and associated with, with hospitalization and mortality. So this, this is one of the sort of minor criteria to support the diagnosis of uh, HFPF. So in 2016, the uh, uh, American Society of Ecuadorphy and the European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging both together algorithms to help to diagnose diastolic function, not to diagnose HFPF. And I put them next to each other. The one on the left is for those with normal LV, and the one on the right for some people with depressed or abnormal LV. Uh, but you see on the left side, you, they use the E2A prime, the uh, septal E prime, the uh, lateral E prime, the TR and LA. And what they say, you have if you have three or more, then you have diastolic function. If you have list F1, then you don't. But if in the middle, you don't know. And if you have LV, uh, abnormal LV, then they use the, uh, the mitral inflow, you'll use the ETA uh, a ratio, which is then 0.8, and with no small E wave, then you're normal. If uh, otherwise, then you have to uh, look into these three parameters, the ETA prime more than 14, TR more than 2.8, and lift rate of volume is more than 34. If you have two or more, and then you have a desert function. If you have one, you don't, uh, but there's a group in the middle where you don't know. And what you can see from these two, what I can say that if you have just E to A prime more than 14 alone, actually it's considered normal, not only intermediate. So uh, you can read into this as much as you want. Again, the difficulty is that, that exactly as we said with the, with the, with the tissue double velocity, the the, 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 the MAC, the, the prosthetic valve, the atrial fibrillation, so to apply this uh, algorithm, and also what to do with the intermediate figures. Uh, somebody like this with E to A uh, ratio of 0.5 uh, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and small, uh, small, small, uh, small E, then that's, that's, that's normal. Uh, this, a person like this with E to A prime more than 30, uh, TR of three meters, then they have that sort of function. So what's the role of stress echocardiography in FPF? So this is really used when your uh, resting echocardiography a study does not give you an answer or intermediate value. So uh, it helps unmask high feeling pressure. And typically, as uh, uh, Dr. Salah in his last uh, talk, mentioned we use either semi subine we can use even uh, a treadmill or a bright bicycle. Uh, and basically what they look at is, can you create or can you find with exercise an E to A prime ratio more than 15 uh, with or without a TR more than 3.4. Now the value of statistical echocardiography has been looked into in many papers and, and, and the, basically the, the feeling, yeah, it's an important tool in uncertain cases, Unfortunately, there's no validation study with invasive, which is the gold standard a test for uh, diastolic function. And there is no really a generalized accepted protocol. You see, if they read papers, give you a different protocol than the others. And in up to 20%, you cannot measure the ATA prime ratio with exercise. And in 50%, you cannot measure the TR. 
Um, so then what's the role of invasive hemodynamics in diagnosis of hep F? This is the gold standing really test uh, to uh, diagnose or exclude hep F when you are, when you, you don't, when you cannot diagnose by the clinical picture, the nitrobrine peptide in the rest of the cardiogram. Uh, and basically, if you have a resting uh, pulmonary capillary which pressure of 15 or more, or with exercise more than 25, then you have a diagnosis of hep F. And this has been looked into as, as a, even as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a prediction of long-term mortality. So if you, people who have explained dyspnea, if you uh, show that they have a high pulmonary which pressure with exercise, then they tend to do less well as those who have a normal pulmonary which pressure with exercise, if you see what I mean. So how we can put all this information together? Now, we had to talk about uh, the hef -BEF scores. We have two scores, uh, one uh, developed by the Mayo Clinic called h 2 f -BEF score. And this, they, 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 they developed it uh, uh, based on the study of 414 patients uh, sent uh, with unexplained dyspnea who uh, underwent invasive hemodynamic. 64% had hef -BEF. And basically the H2, is H1 heavy. So if you have body mass index is more than 30, then that scores one. If you have hypertension from two, the hypertension medication scores uh, one. If you've got atrial fibrillation, you score, you score three, even paroxysmal one. Uh, pulmonary, cabbage, uh, pulmonary pressure of more than 35 um, scores one. I can't see the scores from, uh, from my side. Uh, elder, so if you have more than 60 or elderly, you score one. Uh, high filling pressure, they use only E to A prime ratio of more than nine. So from the echo, they use the, the, the basically the, the TR, the E to A prime motion ratio more than 10. And they say if your score is six or more, they have a high probability of HFBF. If your score is uh, zero or one, you don't have it. Between two and five, you don't know. But I, I just, I just uh, called this and said, if you are obese and hypertensive and have atrial fibrillation, you already score six. So you have a high probability of HFBF even without echo regardless of the echo finding. Um, so the European, a year later, 2019, that's what 2018, this is 2019, uh, came, came up with what's called HFA with diagnostic algorithm, and not just scoring system, an algorithm to help diagnose HFBEF. And basically the, the P is the pretest uh, assessment, uh, including diagnostic ECG, echo, natural peptide, and the, uh, we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, the E is the echo natural black score. Then you apply your scores. The F1, and if you still don't have a diagnosis, you do functional assessment with stress echo or invasive. And then the last F2 is really the final etiology. So the, 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 the step one, the B, so this is the pretest probability. So you have to rule out non-cardiac causes and you do your baseline test, X-ray, ECG, echo, natural peptide. And then, you apply the, 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 the scores, their score. And the score basically looks into three domains, uh, functional, morphological, and biomarker. And the functional, they look at the, the A prime, septal, lateral, the average, and the TR and GLS. And from each domain, you can get only two points. So either the major is two, the minor is one. You cannot get three from one. The morphological, the left atrial volume index, uh, the left, left ventricular mass and uh, relative for thickness. And, and the, the, bi the biomarker is the natural enteric peptide based on whether AF or not. Um, and so you can, from each domain, you can get up to two uh, points. And if you have, if you have, a, if you have a, a score of five or more, they don't say high probability. You say they have a definite HFBF. That's the European algorithm. If it's less than one, one or less, then you don't, unlikely. Two to four, uh, you don't know. You need probably some more tests, okay? So what the test you do if you are uncertain, you go to the diastolic stress test, uh, which either go for stress echo. Now the stress echo, you don't use it to say this is definitely have or not, but to give you the score. So you, you're, you're, as we said before, you're unmasked. If you're with stress echo, you get an E to A prime ratio of two, 
and if you got a TR with it more than um, 3.4, that would be three points, either two or three points. Then you add it to your score what you have, and if it's five or more, then you have a diagnosis. If you don't, uh, even with the stress echo, or you, then you go, you go for the invasive hemodynamic. Now the invasive hemodynamic, either resting, left ventricular uh, the, in volume pressure of more than say, 16 or more, or pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, if you just do right side, uh, 15 or more, that diagnose, have been diagnosed, not probably diagnosed. Uh, if, you, if you don't get these figures, then you do it with exercise, but you need figures to be higher, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure for more than 20, 25 or more. Then the final step, once you get diagnosed, you look for etiology, which I'm not going to. So how good these scores are? Now, uh, this paper has, has actually done what the Mayo Clinic did. So they took 156 patients with a chronic unexplained dyspnea, and they did a, a complete uh, cardiopulmonary exercise with invasive. And they, they tried to see, uh, when they applied the score to these people, how they match with this invasive test. And they found that they, are, they, they do perform well, but actually they tend to actually misclassify, they, to tend to underdiagnose, and up to 28% with the low scores and, 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 and both the scores actually have HFPF confirmed by, 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 uh, by invasive hemodynamic. And in this study, what they did actually, they, they looked at 363 patients with unexplained dyspnea and applied uh, the, uh, the, the Mayo uh, uh, score and the European score. And, and they look how each person fit in these scores. And, but what they find that there is actually misclassification. Basically, somebody will score, uh, say, intermediate in one score, will score high in the other score, and vice versa. And overall, they find these tests generally have a, a low negative predictive value, but high positive predictive value. So what the guidelines uh, say or tell us? I mean, the guidelines, basically, the European from, from last year, it says that you need objective evidence of structure and function abnormality and evidence of phrase uh, 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 ventricular field pressure and goes through all the criteria as we did uh, earlier on and whether their sensitivity, specificity, and so on and so forth. And the, uh, the American of this year, again, they, they just basically uh, uh, condition that, that you have to have evidence of peace filling pressure uh, by either non-invasive, non uh, uh, way the natural peptide, peptide raised or diastolic function on imaging or invasive testing uh, hemodynamic measurement. Uh, so if we've got time, I'll just go through other support measures to, to assess help the diagnosis of health path. Uh, but vein, uh, which you can obtain in a lot of patients with just simple transthoracic, can help to so, Sub, give you some evidence of that sort of function, although it's not the, in, the, in the guidelines. And you know, the, uh, the pulmonary vein, basically you look from the apex pulmonary vein at the ATM, so the, it is all positive waves, sorry, positive waves coming towards you. So the S1 is the early systole, just the relaxation of the atrium at the beginning of systole. S2, when the, when the heart contracts, the, uh, the, the mitral annulus goes away toward the apex, the heart's like sucking, shing, so you get again, big S wave. And the D is the passive uh, filling of the ATM. And then the, the reversal AR, basically when the ATM contracts through the flow, it goes into the vein and give you a, a negative wave. And, and that, so with, 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 with higher filling pressure, the systolic wave becomes smaller and the a, 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 AR becomes actually longer. And if the, the reversal, a, a flow reversal more than 30 seconds, that's really quite supportive diagnosis of uh, 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 support for the presence of uh, high filling pressure. Uh, the, the, the other, uh, again, marker that you can look into, you may find it sometimes to help uh, support diagnosis of high filling pressure is what's called the mitral L wave, which basically it's a, it's a, it's a high positive wave between the E and A, uh, basically reflecting the high filling pressure. And if it's more, more, than, more than 20, if it, is, if it is more than 40, quite supportive, high, high filling pressure. But you can see it in even normal people, uh, particularly uh, athletes or bradycardia, but usually less than 40. 
So I'm um, coming to the conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, HFPF should be suspected in patients with unexplained symptoms, particularly those with the, uh, uh, with the comorbidity, the hepatitis with the female, the obese, the atrial fibrillation. The symptoms of, and signs of HFPF are not specific. And a lot of times we attribute them to other conditions wrongly. To, to diagnose yeah, HFPF, to diagnose HFF, you need evidence of increased left ventricular filling pressure. But remember, there's no single non-invasive test that is diagnostic HFF. Diastolic function and HFF are not the same. You can have diastolic function, but not uh, necessarily heart failure. Natural peptide is a very good test to screen for HFF, but be aware that normal value does not exclude HFF, and they need to look exclude other causes of raised natural peptide. The scoring system, whether it's the, uh, the American, the HF, H2, FBF, or the European HFA, BEF, are important, but may underdiagnose FBF. Stress the echocardiography is useful in, in, in uncertain cases, but it has its limitation and there's no standardized protocol. Invasive hemodynamic, when available uh, uh, with or without exercise, are the gold standard to diagnose symptoms diagnose HFPF when the symptom remains unexplained. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, excellent lecture as usual. You know my, my opinion. I always enjoy listening to the heart failure triad, I call them. Dr. Muhammad Lahrari, Dr. Salah Al-Badri, Dr. Muhammad Abdi. Really, I can listen to the three of you even for hours and hours. I will never like get like bored or tired and i enjoy listening and learning from the three of you so uh, let me uh, give the word to dr uh, dr ilham al gaddafi ممكن تعطينا comments about the lecture or the topic okay السلام عليكم طبعا سامحوني اني في الاول انقطع شويه لكن بعدين لحقت okay thank you dr mohammed for this informative presentation اوكي هو الملخص زي ما قلت حضرتك يعني ان الدايجنوسز از ديفيكلت بالذات عندنا احنا في ليبيا طبعا انا حنتكلم من منطق ان الاكسبيرينس في ليبيا في ليبيا طبعا النصيحه اللي بنوجهها للدكاتره ان بيسد اون ذا يوروبيان اند امريكان جايد لاينز ان دايجنوسز اوف هيف بيف اول حاجه قالوها ان وي هاف تو بيسد اون كلينيكال A clinical uh, situation. So I have to take a good history and I have to do a, a perfect examination looking for Framingham criteria. هذه نقدر نديروها في أي مكان في ليبيا مش لازم في في طرابلس anywhere in Libya. ثاني حاجة لما نكمل أنا the clinical examination بتاعي و take a perfect history وأنا شاكة أنا عندي the health buff Let's go to uh, second step. Second step, طبعاً, we can do نفس العملية في ليبيا. At least we have to do a proper echo uh, examination. المشكلة بتاعتنا في ليبيا ما نديروش إلا في systolic function only. وزي ما حضرتكم قلتوا في البداية إن uh, صعب إن نيم مريض نقرع بإن عنده هو heart failure with normal uh, ejection fraction. في هل بدك على أساس إن just systolic function is good so he has no heart failure and this is a big mistake so we have to uh, be careful regarding uh, echo examination we have to complete our echo examination طبعا الحاجات المهمة في الإيكو left ventricular hypertrophy it's only present in 10% of cases of of HFPF according to uh, one study done uh, this year published in uh, the European Journal of Heart Failure. And they say that uh, left atrial volume is more uh, uh, specific and sensitive uh, to care in 90% of the patients with HFPF. So we have to uh, take the measurement of left atrial volume, uh, specific to left atrial volume, okay? Mushkila tanya in mishkul al echo machine fi Libya advanced. Yani mishkul hum and hum Uh, to measure a left atrial volume. Uh, then uh, we have to see if the patient has a congestion. طبعا الكونجيشن هذه نقدر نديروها حتى في في south, في east, في west. 
anywhere in Libya, uh, just uh, be careful of chest X-ray, looking for sign of congestion, uh, ultrasound, uh, sorry, uh, subcostal view, looking for uh, the dilatation of uh, inferior vena cava, uh, looking for the very important thing, the chest ultrasound, which we don't have experience with, but it, uh, it carries a high sensitivity, was not hotter than 94 percent and bnb as i said dr mohammed the bnb problem is that in the hip bif uh half the patients become female obese and old so we have to have uh, a high uh, level uh user had to fill elf uh and after but sharing their diagnosis of uh uh have uh don't forget the scores that get them dr mohammed had here we can apply in our hospital. It's very easy, uh, at least before the next step and, and definite diagnosis is here by an invasive hemodynamic uh, exercise testing. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Shukran, uh, Dr. Ilham. So uh, I, do, I do agree with you. El echo is not just the systolic function. Systolic function is just one part. In the past, everyone cares when they call us, uh, how is the ejection fraction? And how is the ejection fraction? Like multiple questions. So the echo is not just the ejection fraction. Dr. Salah Al-Badri, we're looking to hear from you. Uh, elegant talk, uh, Dr. Muhammad, as usual. Uh, thank you. I don't like to repeat myself because the, we gave this is the second uh, presentation of her path. Uh, uh, but if you observe the complexity of uh, finding and uh, and uh, uh, slides, it's not because of Dr. Muhammad made them complex because the the disease itself it's complex, bizarre. Usually, uh, it's difficult to diagnose, and uh, in medicine in general, if you have any difficult disease then we'll have a scoring system. This is the way to go for diagnosis. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad mentioned the, the scores and I think they are valuable to be used and, and I encourage you to use one of them to get more cases. Um, the second uh, thing I think just mentioned by Dr. Mansour about the systolic function, the Egyptian function. And I'd like just to reflect to Dr. Muhammad. Uh, do you think that ejection function is important now? Do, should we go after it? It's, the, the score, they didn't mention anything about ejection function. And uh, we finally get the diagnosis of hep path. We know that some treatment now will not look for the ejection function as parameter. Is it no longer ejection fraction? What uh, do you think? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, guidelines. Okay. 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 ال هارد فيلو وذا بريزيرف ديجكشن فاكشنز مازال في يعني اكثريه الدراكس في في كلاس 2 بي اور اور ليس اوكي ذس از ماي اوبينيون اي دونت نو يا ام ان يور سايد بات اي نيد دكتور محمد بيكوز اي نو ذات هي هاز ديفرنت اوبينيون So yeah, I'm but, uh, challenging him to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think a lot of people take. I will talk, talk about is the ejection function still, 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 still relevant? Is it still, uh, still of, of, of importance? I think it is. I think it is. And I think uh, there's, 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 there's no doubt uh, uh, that, the, particularly from uh, not from the prognosis point of view, we, we, I think we all agree that you know, HFBF and FRF both are bad, both bad, both poor prognosis, very, very similar. But there are treatment that should be uh, more effective, the lower your rejection yeah. fraction is. So there's, yeah. there's, uh, there's, no, there's no delay in that. Um, but but we also know now, you know, and uh, is, 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 a, is, a, is a, is a, you know, a disease that you, you really, really very elegantly uh, explained last time. It actually said disease of the periphery than the heart than, rather, than, rather than the heart. To the periphery, so it is all your 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 kidneys, it's your it's your whatever, it's your diabetes, your blood pressure, and you you have to take care of these 
you know, which, we, which we should do. We do it for half biff and half ref. But still, despite, despite that, and uh, Dr. Abdu again last time elegantly uh, said that maybe even in the half biff, there are people who actually will still respond, respond to those um, guideline directly therapy, which is class B, class B as, as Dr. Ilham said. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even from Baragon, that, you know, all women, regardless of which fraction, they benefit, benefit from uh, uh, secretary for certain, and be able up to a fraction of 57% do respond. We know that from the top cat, as again, Dr. Abdul mentioned that, uh, you know, the American benefit, the Russian didn't benefit, was it because the way the study done or the compliance of the protocol, whatever. Uh, so, uh, I, I mean, I, I personally, you know, I mean, we treat, we treat comorbidity regardless of what's HFF or HFREF. But when we get to, to this treatment, I mean, again, I think we all agree on the four pillars for the HFREF. But even for the HFF, definitely I will give them SGL2 inhibitor. Definitely I'll give spinal tone. I, when patient doesn't respond, I go for the secubitor for certain. I do. And I love patient with HFF, I, I give them on this, particularly the woman. But I don't use it as a first or second line. You know, in the HFREF, you try to put all the four pillars as soon as you can, but they have Beth, you probably do it stepwise, and you do maybe, of course, the diuretic, I'm not doing the uh, decongestion is very important, the first thing, but then you go for a uh, you know, spinal doctor, unless they have a contraindication from the kidneys or potassium, and I will definitely the ember because you know it's a safe drug you can use for everybody. And then will be that the third step will be interest uh, uh, if if you don't respond. Obviously, it treat the comorbidity that we said. So, uh, so I don't know whether I've answered your question, Salah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah and now it's uh, some saying that we we could start quadruple therapy without knowing the ejection fraction. I think this is applicable maybe to the SGLT2 uh, inhibitors after the deliver trial because we know that it's across all ejection factors. For others, yeah. I think still we need to know about ejection function. Ejection function still in, as Dr. Elham said, in 2022, uh, ACC, AHA, and European 2001, uh, st st uh, still is uh, 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 a parameter which we should uh, consider and follow for starting uh, treatment and follow. And then we should, we should not forget about device also. So device also, you know, we cannot implant without knowing the ejection function. I think what, we, what we're trying really, um, to be honest, my point from the take home message from this talk or discussion is that really do not dismiss HFBF, do not dismiss heart failure, just because they have a good ejection fraction and just okay. because they are, you cannot have an T-bone B or it is normal or you, your echo parameter does not fit to, so you, you can, as you said, if you, I, I, I highlighted the, the Mayo Clinic scores, it just because if you, if you are obese, if you are hypertensive, you could AF, then you have have BEF, regardless of the echo, because that you'll score six. So it, the, the, the message, just be, please do not dismiss the diagnosis of BEF and think that this patient still in front of you could have a BEF, unless you have a clear explanation for his, 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 or, his or her symptoms. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh... Uh, at least uh, for me, when I see patient in the office, I tell them sometimes I have the heart model and explain, it is not just about the heart, it's about the heart and what that pump is going to supply. So I tell them, if you have the heart in my hand and I have the heart model, I would say, if you have a hundred bound body, 200, 400, which heart is struggling more? So it's about the filling pressure and so what about the weight that that heart supplies. So again, it goes back to the foundation. And I mentioned it to most of my patients, I tell them like during my medical school training, I came up with eight or nine pillars. It taught me the source of most of the cardiovascular conditions. But I tell them like, tell me what do you eat? Do you exercise? Do you have an extra weight? Do you smoke? Do you drink? Do you do drugs? Diabetes, hypertension, family history, and hyperlipidemia. And apply them for everyone. So at least this is a message to our uh, colleagues, our providers, emphasize those risk factor modification. Don't wait until someone end up with HFPF. You have to prevent, fight obesity, extra weight, exercising, healthy diet. Emphasize is so important. I tell them it's more important than stenting or doing devices. So again, the foundation, this is the basic thing that we should, uh, we should achieve too. Uh, Dr. Ayman Smear raised his hand. Uh, go ahead, uh, Zamil Ayman. 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله شكرا دكتور منصور شكرا دكتور محمد محاضرة رائعة ممتازة جدا طبعا الموضوع تشالنجينج كومبلكس سمعت تعليق دكتورة الهام مشكور دكتور صلاح أتفق معكم تماما أعتقد أنه هو لما تبدأ الإيجكشن فراكشن لو اتس ان ايزي دايجنوسيس بعدين التاسك تو بوت ذا بيشنت اون ذا جايد لاينز ثيرابي والفولو اب واوبتمايز التريتمنت حاليا تاو الكواد ثيرابي اللي تكلم عليه دكتور صلاح ودكتوره الهام اللي هو الاس ال جي 2 انهبيتور الارني او الاس ال ار والسبيرولاكتون ام ار اي والابروبريت بيتا بلوكر فذيس از جود التشالنج طبعا انت دكتور محمد غطيت فيري نايس واي في الهيف بيف It's not easy diagnosis. هو أصلا يعني is not one disease. يعني it's a different phenotype. يعني حتى response لل therapy right now, we don't have any proven therapy في the HFPF except now في the SGLT inhibitor promising data. We need long follow up, but this is this is good. And I think it's a game changer SGLT inhibitor the cost. أنا يعني بنرجع للموضوع المحاضرة عندي comment اللي هو ال ال challenge diagnosis. يعني بالذات على الريفليكشن على الدكتوره الهام في في ليبيا يعني عارف انت في قله الريسورسز والاكيرسي بتاع التستنج زي البي ام بي البرو بي ام بي ونفس الشيء ان الايكو مالي الفوكس على السيستوليك نوت الدايستوليك فانكشن اللي هو الريفليكشن تبع الهيف بيف فانا بنقول لي اي فيزيشن يعني ستارتنج في البراكتس A uh, couple of things. The first thing in the kinta, if you suspect patient and a heart failure, you don't without even having the echo yet. Uh, like the patient and the risk factors that we talked about criteria, Dr. Mohammed. And you can start a trial of of diuretic therapy. For example, put it. And this, of course, was one of the one of the minor criteria in Framingham. And you put the patient on a small dose diuretic, for example, Lasix 40 milligram, and bring them in a couple of weeks, see the response. هذا will help you يعني confirm your diagnosis و assess the patient response. ف دي keep that in mind. Uh, no one die from two weeks of uh, diuretic or go to kidney injury because of that. As far as you have close off, ف keep that in mind. The heart failure is a clinical diagnosis. انت في الاوفيس زي ما قال دكتور الهام لو شفت المريض ودرت له assessment وحسيت انه هو عنده congestion في physical exam, GVD, lower edema, crackles, gallop rhythm. Whatever you have to practice this, has said in our mid matter in hypertension. You know that hypertension of heart disease is the most common cause of half uh, pef. I mean, the main factor. For more important than that, it can be aggressive for the management of hypertension. Those patients. I mean, if you come with blood pressure in the systolic 140 or 150, we don't say okay, get back today in the office. No, we tell the patient, let him have a check in the week, the week coming. Get the pressure every day. Write down the number and go and take it. Test it on the salt intake, as we talked about, Doctor Mansour. So it's just the point in that these tools, low available, helpful, or even though still challenge to diagnose. Like in sometimes even a trial of short-term diuretic therapy or reassess close follow-up, it might help confirm your diagnosis. And thank you. I don't know if the doctor or the expert, Doctor Mohammed, has any comment on this point. If there is any objection or support or any more tips for the junior doctor. Thank you. Uh, I, 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 I think the use of diuretic as a, as, a, as, a, as a test, I use it even now. I use it even here when we got all the facility probably better, slightly you know, better than Libya. So when I'm struggling, I, the echo doesn't really that fit, patient breathless, some edema, and I, they cannot do the stress so I don't have access to invasive. I just try them, as you said, just a small dose diuretic and bring them back and see what happens. So it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not a, a wrong or bad thing, rather actually leave the patient struggling and, and or push them away and say it's not, it's not to do with me. Go to your, whatever chest physician or it's not your heart. It's just your weight or whatever. Uh, Doctor Osama, <laughs> he raised the question in the chat box. Maybe Doctor Osama Bhilil, you can uh, join us and uh, and um, uh, bring up your question directly to the to the expert panel and uh, to Doctor Muhammad Lahrari. Doctor Osama. إذا كان في إمكانية. السلام عليكم. السلام عليكم. شكرا دكتور منصور بارك الله فيك. دكتور محمد بارك الله فيك على المحاضرة الرائعة جدا از يوجوال بارك الله فيك ان شاء الله. الله يعطيك انت مشكلة. شكرا دكتور صراحة شكرا دكتور الهام. الحقيقة موضوع الهف بف هذا صداع كل ما يجيك مريض داهش وتلقى نورمال ايكو حيقعد عندك صداع في العيادة. وبالاخص كان في ميل تقعد ماشية جاية عليك فعلا زي ما قال الدكتور أيمن. It's a headache for the for the cardiologist and for the physician. 
لكن هي موضوع الثيرابيوتيك ترايل يو جيف هيم اور يو جيف ذا بيشنت ترايل اوف ميديكيشن اند يو سي ذا ريسبونس اعتقد سمعوني في الكلمه اتس مور ابليكابل في ليبيا زي ما قالت الدكتور الهام ونوهت سابقا بيكوز اوف ذا لاك اوف ريسورس اتس بيتر ذان ليفينغ البيشنت ستراجلينغ حكايه الدسنيا او شرط البريث الماي كونسيرن احنا الايديا نتاعنا ان الهف بيف ليبيا او الكونسبت نتاعنا عليه انه هو اتس ا بيناين ديزيز وانس ان جيف فراكشن از نورمال فورجيت اباوت يعني البيشنت في النهايه از نوت يعني از نوت ا كيلينج ديزيز ذيس از ذيس از اعتقد وبارك الله فيك دكتور محمد يو ريز ذيس بوينت في السلايدز بتاعك ان المورتاليتي ريت في الهف بيف از جوينج اولموست ذا سيم زي الهف ريف فاعتقد ان الاويرنس اوف ذا بروبلم الهف بيف از كيلينج ديزيز It has its own mortality. مش مجرد إنه just rejection fraction is low. Okay, this patient is should be in the treatment. وبعدين تروح لل device, ICDs, RTD, whatever it is. لكن the F, F also is a killing disease. The the point that he raised by Dr. Salah, and we want to hear from Dr. Mohammed, the comment of him. The case of rejection fraction when the heart failure is is not a number. يعني it's a spectrum. The patient may be from rejection fraction 60 لكن بعد فتره ممكن 40 فقصدي هي هذه البوينت ريز الاويرنس بتاع مانجا فيزيشن هم تريتنج بيشنتس ود وايد رينج اوف اوف هارت فيلير سبيكتر فهذه البوينت اللي انا حبيت نثيرها مره ثانيه واللي ترى دكتور صلاح وكونسنتريتنج عليها بارك الله فيك وثانك يو اجين محمد بارك الله فيك ات واز فيري نايس ثانكس You touch the the points the the in the headache in the head. All of it. شكرا دكتور اسامه حنشوف التشات بوكس ونقرا الاسئله الموجوده ونعطوها للاور اكسبرت بانل ودكتور محمد دكتور علي رجب هذا كويشن از اولويز نيسيساري ذات اول بيشنتس ود هيرف ريف Uh, will already have half ref. I think he meant he meant uh, will already have maybe half ref. Uh, Dr. Salah. Yeah, there is some you know uh, sub classification of the uh, it's, it's already mentioned by Dr. Muhammad, uh, the patient who have uh, a half ref and then improved uh, to uh, uh, preserve dejection fraction or improved dejection fraction. I mean uh, more than. 40 or uh, uh, and uh, improvement more than 10 percent with a reading before below uh, 40 and remains more than uh, 40. Uh, so so the, 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 this entity will support treating patient as a full spectrum, I mean a continuum. So uh, the, the, the HFREF might improve to uh, uh, a level of preserved ejection fraction. But if you see the guideline, you say we have as a class one indication, we should not stop the treatment despite improvement in ejection fraction. So this will give us a lesson that it's not a number. Even if you improve, we should not stop. And the reason that they, they, we have evidence from a uh, thread shift trial, when they uh, it was a small trial because ethically was not, uh, they, they couldn't get uh, enough uh, patients, well, like 51 patients. And when they stopped the treatment, 40% uh, of them relapsed. This was done in UK. So, and then when they cross over, even the, the people who were uh, taking treatment and then stopped, 35% 30, 30, of them uh, relapsed. So they give a strong signal that even patient who has uh, have their their patients who have their uh, ejection fraction improved, it is contraindicated to stop their treatment. So the HFREF, even if improved to uh, a, 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 a normal uh, ejection fraction, we have to continue. So the treatment will be the same even if he improved. Now, uh, the HFPF, to go back to HFREF, it's not very common. And 
the disease itself has has its uh, poor prognostic uh, uh, course. So it will not, as as mentioned by Dr. Muhammad, they have almost similar uh, uh, morbidity and mortality. Though a non-cardiac death will be more, and they will die more with cancer and infection. So if you if you look to the the spectrum, the whole spectrum, I think we should especially if you don't have good tools to diagnose, we should use all our weapons, neurohormonal blockade, whatever, ACE inhibitor, ARNI, uh, uh, ARP, whatever you have. And we should not forget about MRA, spironolactone, very, very effective, both in HEFREF and HEFBEF. HEFBEF was, as we, we talked in the discussion, last uh, presentation uh, shared by Dr. Mahmoud when he explained what happened in TOPCAT trial. So the spironolactone is very effective treatment and it is widely available. So if you have a patient with heart failure, irrespective of the ejection fraction, spironolactone is, is an important medication to, 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 uh, to treat the patient, our patient. Now SGLT2, if, if available, it's uh, readily, and now we have uh, robust uh, two trials showing that uh, 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 SGLT2 are very effective and have PEF. And we know from before that they are very effective and have uh, REF. So if it's available, then SGLT2 will be an uh, additional tool or weapon to treat uh, heart failure across all ejection fraction. Yes. I hope this will uh, answer my your question. That's, that's great. So just uh, I agree with you 100%. Uh, I will always I always face sometimes this scenario. I had multiple patients when their rejection fraction improved and they insist to stop the medication. They insist. But once you live it with heart failure, you will have heart failure for the rest of your life. Once you have diabetes, hypertension, it's like atrial fibrillation. Patient has ablation procedure. They say, if the AFib away, no, it doesn't go away. You did isolation. It's just the AFib will never go away. Maybe take your heart out, put a new heart, maybe at that case, and it's not worth it. So anyhow, uh, uh, Dr. Ayman Smear, he want to, uh, to, add, uh, to add a comment he mentioned? Dr. Ayman? As uh, Mansour, uh, I just want to follow up comment on Dr. Dr. Salah. I think he put it very nicely, just few, uh, to add some caveat. And that you have to differentiate between uh, uh, heart failure with improved ejection fraction and normalized ejection fraction. As I said, Dr. Salah, in the data showed if you stop therapy for patients with improved ejection fraction, not normalized, 30 to 40 percent of them, they may relapse. Hi, Tatik, important uh, fact in the heart failure is a chronic disease. There is no cure. But a few, few ex exceptions, for example, stress cardiomyopathy, they have very good outcome. Uh, tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy, if you turn it tachycardia, usually they do okay. Earlier, there is different phenotype for hef -bef. So Keep that in mind. And etiology. Now, el el in my practice, or at least, I will keep them on therapy for a year. If patient has no side effect, if cost is not an issue, I continue with that. If they ask to stop it, I do an MRI. If I see structure abnormality, fibrosis, late enhancement on the MRI, I tell the patient there is some structure abnormality, it may relapse. So keep that. If the MRI show no evidence of structure abnormality, like fibrosis, because it takes at least a year to reverse the neurohormonal exchange or disturbance in patient with HFF. But just keep in mind, the heart failure is a chronic disease. There's no cure. And that if improved is different than normalized, what well, doesn't mean that patient cure, so keep that in mind. I mean, the <laughs> patient has issue with cost, with side effect, it's reasonable at this point to hold, but keep a close follow-up on those patients. Shukran. Shukran. So uh, uh, Tani, if Dr. Dries, uh, Sal Soal, the test results depend on the examiner uh, in regard to ejection fraction. So he said some um, readers will say 50%, others maybe say 35%. Why should we treat all of them the same regardless of the ejection fraction? Why people reading echocardiogram, sometimes they have different opinion in the ejection fraction. Some say 50%, some say 35%. Why should we treat all of them the same once we diagnose them with heart failure? 
هو طبعا according to guidelines treatment is not the same uh, إذا كان عندي uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction زي ما قالوا الدكاترة بكري عندنا في guidelines عندنا مجموعة treatment we have to start it if not اللي هي heart failure with preserved ejection fraction ما فيش treatment خشت في guidelines as a class one except diuretic اوكي ال guidelines الأخيرة متاع ال متاع ال American Heart Association Uh, وضعت ال اس جي ترانسبورتر انهبيتور از كلاس 2A اونلي الدراجز الثانيات كلهم كلاس 2 2B سو اتس نوت نوت ذا سيم تريتمنت از نوت ذا سيم شكرا ذاتس اي توتالي اجري ويز يو دكتور الهام It's based on clinical trial, and the cutoff point that was used in the clinical trials. Maybe here, Doctor Dries, one comment I will add. Mm -hmm. It depends who read the echocardiogram. We say sometimes there is disagreement, and we know from the data there is inter-observer variability by 10%. But if someone read the ejection fraction, let us say 25%, and other one tell you 50%, I think there is an issue with the reader here. So at least in terms of maybe, and Doctor Salah Al Badri mentioned it elegantly. He said it's a continuum. Suppose we argue, is it 39% or 41%? I agree with you, it doesn't matter because we know the systolic function is down and sometimes even with mildly reduced systolic function, we try to treat them as reduced systolic function. We can have an extension, but someone 70% it should be different than maybe 40 or 30%. Uh, well, so I'm sorry. مش عارف دكتور منصور في نقطة هذه أنت أنا جلاد أنك أنت يو بروت أب الانتر أوبزرفر فاريبيلتي بتاع 10 بوينت لانه مهم جدا طبعا تكلم انت اكسبرت ريدر يعني احكي لك انا كازن ايكو كارديوغرافر شوف اي ثينك ام شور الاكسبرت مان كلهم اجري وذ مي لما تبدا الاجكشن فراكشن ليس ذان 40% وي اول اجري اون ات يعني صعب تلقى انه واحد ايكو جوغرافر اكسبيرينس انه وي كان تيل اف ذا اي اف مور ليس ذان 40% اف ذا اي اف از نورمال ايفري ون كان اجري انت انت الجري زون هذه اللي ما بين 30 تو 50 يو جيت ديفرنت فاريبيلتي هاد مهم اصلا حتى بالعربي از ا بوردر لاين ف وانس يو هاف ا لو اي اف دايجنوستس وايز از نوت ذات هارد وان نورمال اي اف از نوت هارد الايشيو في الـ في الايكو ريدنج تشينج طبعا تكلم انت على سم وان سو يعني اكسبيرت دوينج ان ايكو مش ا بيجنر ذس از وين يو هاف ذات سيجنيفيكانت انتر اوبزرفر فاريبيلتي ف ان جنرال الايكو از ا ريلايبل تول تو ديفرنشيات لما قال دكتور الهام الهف بيف والهف ريف هي فكرتها ان تيليو It doesn't give you the diagnosis of heart failure. The whole diastology thing, how يعني is different than a heart failure. Doctor Salah Muhammad on the first slide, got in the diastolic function different than a heart failure. So keep that in mind. These criteria help you support your diagnosis. So the the idea is that you divide them as half ref or half pef or borderline to tell you that which proven therapy you can use in certain diseases. Just more classification. Thank you. شكرا زميلي دكتور ايمن اند جاست للتنبيه للزملاء الموجودين تقدر ترجع لمحاضره تشيمبر كوانتيفيكيشن بيست اون ذا امريكان سايت اوف ايكو كارديوغرافي ابديت فروم 2015 اعطينا عليها محاضره السنه الماضيه وموجوده على الليبيان كاردكس الليبيان كاردكس سوسايتي ات ليست هاو تو ميجر ديجكشن فراكشن افويد فور شورتنينج يوز ديفينيتلي اف نيدد از ويل تو use uh, Simpson by Blaine method uh, to, for accurate assessment and objective assessment of the ejection fraction. But take a look at that lecture. You will find how to measure the LV mass and relative wall thickness and left atrial volume index as well. So the second Dr. Osama Bihilil, Dr. is every half bef patient will end up into half ref with time, Dr. Muhammad Al-Halari. Half bef going into half ref. Because uh, every half ref patient will end up in two half ref with time. I don't think there's evidence for that really. I think it, the uh, the uh, the half ref can go into the improved heart failure, but the half pef unless they have a you know a different insult or different event or cause, they don't by nature progress to half ref. Uh, correct me, Salah, if I am wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes, yeah, hundred percent. The second question, uh, also to Doctor Mohammed Lahrari, how long you put the patient with HFPF on treatment? Uh, I think now we all agree this is a, this is a chronic condition that it does not have a a cure. So the treatment is really long term, 
the diuretics are the one that you adjust according to the need. But once you've decided, for example, that patient eligible for SGL2 inhibitor, this is the treatment for, for, for life and unless side effects develop. Then you treat the, for, I'm talking about HFBF, all the comorbidities in the blood pressure, diabetes, ischemic heart disease, whatever you look for and you treat the atrial fibrillation. Um, again, if you uh, go into the spinal octum, which a lot of us do, again, long-term, less, you know, uh, contraindicated develop. So basically, in, in, in simple term, a treatment for life. It's, it's like uh, your cholesterol. I'm sure you face this all in your clinics. You give them statin, they come to you two months later, they might cholesterol is normal, I've stopped it. Um, you know, this is, this is you know, day one, this is treatment for life. It's difficult to accept, but this is treatment for life for as many other conditions as your hypertension, as your diabetes, as heart failure is, is a chronic condition, treatment is for life. نفتح الستيج ممكن نسأل سؤال أنا ما فيش ما أعتقدش إني missed أي question في الشات بوكس missing now I mentioned this question before we start our session how do you convey the message that to a patient that they have congestive heart failure and you let them know that the strength of their heart muscle or the ejection fraction is normal what is a a better way so I need your opinion and Dr Salah Al Badri and Dr Al Hamid Gaddaf um, I, 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 I say to the patients, you know, I mean, I, I, I work in an Arabic country, so I, I say to the patient that your heart uh, it contracts, okay, but it does not relax. It does not relax, so it does not really, the function is not normal. So the, this is, you know, allow the, the, the fluid to accumulate in your lung. So your heart is not functioning normally. It contracts well, but it's not functioning normally. Uh, how to convey to them this is a, you know, a, a serious life threatening condition. It's, as with any, with any other condition, it's really uh, not, not that easy. But uh, basically, I say the heart contracts well, it doesn't function normal, it does not relax, it does allow. ما السلام عليكم معلش غير نبي نعرف كيف تقول فاب باللغة العربية دكتور محمد سامحني يعني سامحني أوكي لا لا حسب لا والله كيف توصل المسج للمريض بارك الله فيك سوري أنا والله أنقول ويكند هذا ودرت حتى الويكند هذا نقول ال 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 قلبك ما ما يتخيش ينقبض طبيعي لكن في لما يرد خبش يتعب بالدم في مشكلة ما يتخاش كويس معناتها الدم هذا اللي بيجي من اللي بيجي من ريا يلقى صعوبه يدخل القلب فتجمع لك سوائل الفريع كاكسبلانيشن للهارت فيل سيلف يعني كيف ان هارت انه هو ما يشتغلش طبيعي ينقبض طبيعي انقباض طيب لكن ما ما يرتخاش فالدم يجد صعوبه لما يجي من الريا يفش فترجع على الريا وتجمع سوائل الفريع ويجي لك يزيد ضيق النفس وضيق التنفس سمثينج لايك ذس بالمناسبة دكتور صلاح دكتور سامر حتى بالانجليزي تو اكسبلين للبيشنت الليمن بيرسون البيشنت از نوت ايزي يعني انت مثلا نقول لك يعني المرضى هذا شو نقول لهم انا نبدا نشد في البالطو بتاعي ونضيق على روحي نقول لك كان واحد لابس جاكة هيك يضيقه وما يقدرش يتنفس ما يقدرش يستريح بها يعني فحتى لو بالانجليزي از نوت ايزي تو جيف الاكسبلينيشن لكن اذا ما قال الدكتور محمد انه الفكره في ريلاكسيشن فاني نشبه لهم بان واحد لابس حوايج ضيقات جاكه ضيقه هيك نسكر علي البلط ولا قد ما نقدر ونقول له ما عادش نقدر نتنفس شكرا دكتور صلاح البدري اه والله هي صح صعب انك توصلها لكن قلنا الحمد لله هو ضخ القلب طبيعي لكن عندك مشكله في الارتخاء وضغط دخل حجره القلب عاليه وهذا يسبب ميه في الصدر هذا علاش نحن حنبدو مدر اهم شيء الان المدرات وفي ادويه ثانيه لازم نبدو فيها وتستمر عليها ممكن نكي بالطريقه هذه نوصل الفكره تمام دكتور الهام القدافي طبعا اغلبيه تسمع فيا ولا اوكي اغلبيه اغلبيه المرضى بيكونوا في ميل اول معناها صعب انك تقعمز وتشرح لهم ما يفهموكش فتاخذ ورقه وترسم القلب وتقول لهم راهو القلب ينقبض كويس ما ينبسط الانبساط معناها في الارتخاء ما يقدرش يرتخي الضغط حيكون عالي في الحجرات نتاع القلب ولهذا انت انت حتحسي بالدهشه لازم حتاخذي علاج مدر للبول 
وطبعا لازم تنقصي وزنك لازم ارد بالك من الضغط من السكر من الدهون ولازم تتابع كويس المشكله المرضى ما يتابعوش كويس في ليبيا وياخذوا الدراجز نتاعهم آه هذا كان وجد ان وجد العلاج اغلبيه الادويه للاسف مش موجوده اغلبيه التحاليل مش موجوده فالصعوبه عندنا في الفولو اب نتاع المرضى هذه حاجه الحاجه الثانيه حتى في الفولو اب when the patient come uh, to you uh, in, the in time المشكلة ما فيش titration of treatment أغلبية drugs يقعدوا the same dose و... وهذا طبعا من الأخطاء الكبيرة اللي نواجهوا فيها هلبة في ليبيا شكرا دكتورة دكتورة إلهام يعني لأني ما شفتش أسئلة أخرى ومازال عندنا ممكن 5 minutes فنبي نسأل سؤال تاني الهيستيف هيتروجينوس ديزيز معناها ديفرنت شينو تايبس ما نحكوش احنا على كارديك امريديوس او انفلتريت اوف هارد ديزيز او هايبر تروبيك كارديومايوباثي ليت مي اسك ابوت سبيسيفيك بيبل وذ هيف بيف اند دي ويت لايك 150 كي جي 200 كي جي وذ مور بوديبيسيتي اف دي لوز ويت كان ذيس كونديشن بي ريفرسيبل دي ويل بي اوت اوف ذا هارت فيلير از اي منشن يو هاف ذا هارت يو هاف ذا بريفري يو تشينج ذا بريفري فور اكزامبل يو وي لايك 200 kg, you go down, you lose 100 kg with bariatric surgery. They will say, they ask me a question, do you think my heart failure will go away? Dr. Mohammed Laharari. Uh, I'm not aware of bariatric surgery improving heart failure, uh, but I think uh, FPF, if you control all your comorbidities and you treat them and the patient becomes Asymptomatic, you do your echo, you find your, um, you find the reverse remodeling, the the diastolic barometer improved, is not on diuretics. Uh, would you say that's cure? Maybe, maybe you treat them, but I'm not aware of the obesity itself per se as a treatment for health. Salah. Yeah, uh, so, so the obesity uh, phenotype can be associated with high output cardiac failure. And in some studies that showed that if you, uh, if they lose uh, weight in a, in a good way, then it might be reversible to some degree. Uh, but this is not widely agreed on, but this is what, uh, what, uh, what I read about. But you know, when, uh, when, uh, when, uh, before we close, you mentioned uh, Dr. Mansour about the mimickers. Uh, especially constructive pericarditis uh, in Libya. You know, we have still uh, tuberculosis is existing. Mm -hmm. So uh, just be careful of, because uh, constructive pericarditis can, can present or mimic half path. Just, uh, and we have the tool to, tools to, to diagnose constructive. And I know from ECHO series that you, 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 you explained constructive pericarditis and how to diagnose. So uh, we should put these uh, mimicers in mind, amyloidosis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and constructive pericarditis before, you know, uh, treating patient with uh, with uh, with medical treatment. Uh, consider them because they have the, we have options to cure them. Uh, thank you, Dr. Salah, uh, Salah Al Badri. Uh, let us have the final comments from the expert panel, Dr. Ilham Al Gaddafi, Dr. Ilham. فاين الكيف يعني انا اللي نفكر ال انا اللي نختم يعني which each one of you do you give like take home message to the audience from each لا الهوم مسج للدكاتره اللي يسمعوا فيها في ليبيا زي ما قلت بكري ان احنا نواجه مشاكل عده في ليبيا في الدايجنوسز وفي العلاج وفي وفي المرضى نتاعنا يعني المرضى اغلبيتهم فاقدين الثقه في في الطبيب الليبي للاسف فزي ما قلت بكري في حاجات نقدر نديروها ايفن لو حتى انا كنت في الكفره مثلا مع احترامي للكفره طبعا مش معناها دكاتره غادي ما يفوش لا نتكلم على الامكانيات اوكي ايفن حتى لو كان ما عندكش ايكو ايكو كويس تقدر تاخذ هيستوري كويس دو بروبر اكزامينيشن لوكينج فور ذا كرايتيريا اوف هارت فيلير ال Uh, try to uh, to use the uh, scores 
اللي موجودات عندنا سواء كان الامريكيه ولا البريطانيه الاثنين نقدروا ان سوري الامريكيه او الاوروبيه الاثنين قابله للتحقيق في ليبيا نقدروا ان نديروها وبعدين الفايلز نتاعنا ندي من دي نقول فيها حتى في الميتنج نتاعنا في المستشفى الجامعي الفايلز راهو ناقصات هلبه So you have to be careful uh, when you take history and do examination with your patient. You have to explain everything to your patient and you have to uh, follow the guidelines as you can. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ilham. Uh, uh, Dr. Ilham Smear uh, joined us from the start and contributed a lot at the end of the session. Can you uh, say your final remarks? حاضر المنصور شكرا لك طبعا شكرا دكتور محمد على المحاضرة الممتازة كالعادة وللإكسبرت بانل أعتقد نقاش ممتاز جدا شخصيا استفدت صراحة يعني مثال السكورز اللي كتبها دكتور محمد أنا أول مرة نشوفه فمشكور لك تعلمت منك حاجة جديدة زي كل مرة بالنسبة للزملاء بدأت في ليبيا الهارت فيلر ود بريزيرفيك فراكشن از تشالنجينج دايجنوسز ديفيكولت از نوت جاست يو يعني إيفن أس أز كارديولوجيست ود إكسبيرينس وي ستراجل ود ذات So keep that in mind. Think of it as a chronic disease. It's not an acute illness like URI or well, pneumonia. It's a chronic disease. concept If you don't have much resources, but you feel strong about your clinical diagnosis, the inner heart failure is a clinical diagnosis, it's okay to use a trial of diuretic for short term as far as you have a close follow-up with the patient. Very, very important risk factor modification, aggressive risk factors, especially particularly hypertension. Hypertensive heart disease, one of the most common cause of heart failure. It's important you be aggressive managing then their blood pressure medication. Sometimes using diuretic like hydrochlorothiazide, it helps with some element of diuretics and blood pressure control too. Keep that in mind. When you order an echo, since uh, in Libya, uh, most people, they don't do a complete echo. In your order, but ask what you want, right? Systolic function and diastolic filling pressure. Mention those points that Dr. Muhammad mentioned. You want to know what's the E over A ratio, what's the RVSP or what's the stock over pressure. Put them on your request. So keep that in mind. Good luck. Dr. Salah Al Badri. Shukran, Dr. Mansour, Dr. Muhammad, Dr. Ilham. Very nice session. The message to the Zamanana in Libya, and I have been coming. كلينيكلي اقوى من قد تكون اقوى من كثير من الناس اللي نشتغل معاهم برا يعني if you have less resources then your clinical ability will be more يعني I, I, I believe that you have excellent clinical skills وانا يعني بيكم تستعملوا your clinical skills to discover more cases to help more patients of heart failure this is my message Thank you, Dr. Salah. And uh, finally, Dr. Mohammed Harari. Okay, um, Barakallahu uh, Fikum. Well, it's a very interesting session. Well, thanks for the expert panel, Lou Ayman, for the contribution. Well, obviously, you also as a moderator. Uh, my message really uh, HFBF is very common. And really, if you are seeing or diagnosing less HFBF than you should do, if you're, if you're proportion of FBF, as we said, 10%, 20% of your total heart failure, then you are missing a lot of cases. So do not dismiss heart failure. Look for us. You don't have to have the most sophisticated, you don't have to have the exercise or stress echo. You can use that as a simple scores. You can, you know, uh, clinical sense. You can do, uh, as the time in really a good point of trial of diuretic um, uh, um, and to, to to uh, to diagnose to help you diagnose HFBF, and it uh, you know uh, as again mentioned several times the difference phenotypes you you treat the comorbid you look for the hypertension the diabetes the CKD uh, but basically look look for it HFBF is common it is it is as bad as his ref as his ref it's not really that impossible to diagnose it's very difficult to diagnose it is challenging but you, you, there are ways of going around even uh, not having enough um, uh, you know, uh, equipment or facilities, you know. Uh, uh, so scoring system, trial of diuretics, uh, asking your echo op operator to look for, you know, filling pressures specifically. Basically, just look for it and treat it. Comments there. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, at the end of our uh, uh, lecture, I would like to thank all the audience for joining us today. Uh, I would like also to thank the expert panel, Dr. Alhamar Gaddafi from Tripoli a University Hospital, uh, Dr. Uh, Ayman Smear, uh, Associate Program Director at Creighton University, Nebraska, Omaha, Dr. Uh, Salah Al Badri, Consultant Cardiologist and Advanced Heart Failure uh, Specialist. We will also uh, say thank you to our uh, presenter today, Dr. Uh, Mohammed Laharari. Uh, thank you, everyone. And I want to remind uh, uh, the audience that our next, next uh, heart failure lecture will be, I believe, on January 14th. We'll have Dr. Salah Al Badri, because I, as I promised you, I'm not going to leave Dr. Mohammed Laharari, Dr. Salah Al Badri. We'll keep them on board all the time. We need to learn from them. So the topic will be uh, SGLT receptor inhibitor and cardiovascular outcome, January uh, 14, uh, in December, because of the World Cup event in Qatar. I think we will uh, take a break uh, for December. Maybe we'll arrange different lecture, but uh, at least I promise you will be back on January 14 for the heart failure lecture series. Our lecture today will be record is already recorded and it will be uploaded in the Libyan Cardiac Society website by the end of the day. So, barakallahu fikum jami'an. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Shukran. 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 Shukran.